May speak in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, St. Margaret's. Very blessed uh, third Sunday after Pentecost to you. Uh, in addition to being the third Sunday after Pentecost, today is Father's Day. Uh, so a very happy Father's Day wherever you're at with this day. If it's a joyful one, a, a day of remembrance, a day of, of some, some heartache, wherever you are, uh, I wish you every blessing on this day, and I'm glad that we're here together uh, to worship the living God. I want to start off uh, this morning by sharing how much I've appreciated our journey these past several weeks through the first part of Genesis. Now, I know the lectionary only offers us these kind of selective glimpses of Genesis, um, and yet I'm grateful for what we've encountered so far. What I'm especially grateful for, though, is this morning, for the passage we heard just a few moments ago. I know on the surface it, it seems perhaps a little bit prosaic, right? This story of, of Abraham and these divine visitors, and then the story of this promise that's, that's nested within this interaction between Abram, or Abraham rather, and these visitors. Um, but if you just dig a little bit into the story, I'm convinced you'll see um, that it's, it's, it's just absolutely astonishing, captivating. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I described Genesis chapter 1 as one of the most critical building blocks in Christian theology. And much the same can actually be said about this story from Genesis 18. And the reason why it's a building block, the reason why it's important is because it, it, it teaches us, if we can have eyes to see, it teaches us something basic about humanity's relationship with God. And in particular, humanity's restored, repaired, mended relationship with God. But I get ahead of myself. Before I say anything more about Genesis, I want to talk about an essay I ran about the pandemic. I, th I think uh, we really are entering a, a season that could be described as post-pandemic. Um, and as we do so, we're, we're engaging, I think, as a culture in some measure of reflection of where we were and, and, and the road that we've traveled upon. And, and obviously, I mean, this goes without saying, the pandemic brought with it numerous hardships and tragedies. I mean, there are multiple things that we can recall that were just difficult and trying and very sad about our experience. And, and, and one of those tragedies uh, was, and this is what the article was about, was um, one of these tragedies was the, the rise of xenophobia and the relationship between pandemics and the presence of xenophobia. You see, what happened in 2019 and 2020, uh, it, it felt so new and so different to us, but what happened was things unfolded according to a rather familiar script. Humans have built within us an intrinsic distrust of anything different, anything that we perceive as other. And what history has taught us is that pandemics make this worse. Because when a pandemic strikes, we encounter something that's not just new but dangerous, a communicable disease and we often encounter it from a distant land, from a place that we perceive as being other. And so, unsurprisingly, the emergence of xenophobia in 2020, you know, proved to be a global phenomenon. The United States, our home, wasn't alone in its experience of fear and, and even anger towards those whom we perceived to be outsiders, those whom we perceived to be unclean. I've talked a lot about how the pandemic really was apocalyptic, and I've used that term specifically, meaning that, that the, the pandemic revealed something, it unveiled something for us to see. 
And one of the most important things that the pandemic revealed to us was this sort of irony of our modern world. There is something really ironic about how we live in an increasingly interconnected and interdependent global world. And yet, despite all these ties and connections, we're still plagued by an often hostile and even at times violent xenophobia. There's good news, though, in the midst of this. And the good news is that for as long as xenophobia has been around, so has its counterpart. A word uh, known as philoxenia. It's another great word that's borrowed from the Greek. Philoxenia, it literally means love for the stranger. Philos is love and, and xenia, xenos, it's the same word as xenophobia, it, it means stranger. And what's really fascinating is, is this. The word philoxenia appears throughout uh, the New Testament. You'll encounter it from time to time. And in the New Testament, that word, philoxenia, it's translated into the English as hospitality. Did you know that? If you stop and think about that, it's really rather fascinating. Our contemporary culture thinks of hospitality as the joy of hosting people we know. But hospitality, as Scripture conceives it, is in a sense the opposite of this. Hospitality from God's perspective is the self-giving love we have for those whom we do not know. Philoxenia, hospitality, is the act of welcoming, honoring, protecting the stranger. And historically, it's been so important that at times it has meant the difference between life and death. I, I want us to keep these things in mind. I want us to think about philoxenia and hospitality as we turn our attention to Genesis chapter 18. And the first thing I want to share with you is how this story offers us an image of rather dramatic, genuine, authentic hospitality. Please don't miss how Abraham's actions, they run so much deeper than our modern notions of kindness or etiquette. Now, Abraham is up to something more than simply being nice. No, Abraham is demonstrating tremendous courage in and through his philoxenia. By doing so, he is offering us, even this morning, an image of God's own hospitality towards us. Understand what I mean by this, though. I, I first have to mention this. Um, I'm reminded uh, of this famous opening line from L.P. Hartley's 1953 novel, The Go-Between, where Hartley writes, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. To really grasp why Abraham's actions are indeed courageous, we must first grasp the significant differences between his culture and ours. You see, our, our modern world, we, we have been blessed, we have been fortunate to, to transform two closely connected experiences that historically have been very difficult and very dangerous. Traveling to a foreign place and interacting with a foreign people. As unusual as it may seem to us, for most of human history, people have lived all their lives in one place and in one community. And so to travel was not merely to take a risk, but to be seen as posing a risk. The travelers were simultaneously vulnerable and menacing. Travelers both feared the stranger and they were the stranger. And so travelers often had no choice but to live at the mercy of those who were willing to help. 
those who are willing to extend that costly gift of hospitality. And that's exactly what Abraham does this morning. What's really astonishing is that, you know, Abraham does not in any way know or believe that he's extending hospitality, philoxenia, to the God of the universe. I mean, think about it, you know, Sarah actually laughs when the Lord says that she will bear a son. No, what Abraham is doing is he's entertaining God unaware. The fact that these three visitors are in some mysterious way a, a manifestation of the triune God, well, that fact is, is, is kept hidden from Abraham's eyes. From Abraham's perspective, he's simply doing what is right, what is difficult, what is dangerous, what is loving. And yes, by extending hospitality, Abraham is taking a profound risk. And yet he welcomes the stranger anyway in an act of honor and blessing. You might even say that he's engaging in an early form of reconciliation. He's doing his small part to, to help mend and repair a world riven by estrangement. It's at this point I hope we can see the reality of divine hospitality coming into focus. The real power of this story is that it's an icon. It's an image of God's unchanging, unceasing stance towards us. All of us. Towards me and towards you. I mean, this unchanging stance is present throughout all of Scripture. In a lot of ways, it's the story of Scripture. It's there in Genesis 1 with creation. And amazingly enough, it continues after the fall. Every moment, every movement of God towards humanity is rooted in a posture of grace and not merit. It's rooted in hospitality and not hostility. More than that, one thing I want to share with you this morning is this. Um, if the intimacy with God that we received in the beginning was a gift, if God in Genesis 1 calling all of creation, including humanity, good, tov, if that was a gift, then how much more precious is every gift we've received from God since that time? I mean, think about it. The fall there in Genesis 3, that alienated us from God. It estranged us from God. It left us not as friends, but as strangers. And yet, that's when grace appeared once more. That's when grace appeared anyway. Like a light shining through the cracks of a broken vessel. And God chose to become incarnate anyway. As Paul rather bluntly puts it in our epistle reading this morning, Christ died for the ungodly. God became incarnate. And Jesus, God's son, he did all the things that Abraham does in this morning's text. And so much more. I don't want you to miss this, my friends, my brothers and sisters. You know, Jesus did more than offer water for his disciples' feet. He washed his disciples' feet. Jesus did more than bring bread to feed others. He offered his body as bread for the life of the world. Jesus did more than extend life to the stranger. 
He suffered death on a Roman cross in order that we might participate in the divine life itself. Make no mistake, hospitality. Tearing down walls of estrangement strikes at the very heart of our common faith. We are meant for communion. We are meant for intimacy. We are meant to stand before the presence of the living God. We are meant not to earn but simply to embrace. Again, as Paul puts it in our epistle reading this morning, we are justified by faith. We can receive peace with God, and we can stand upon grace. The last thing I want to share with you this morning is this. Um, I was thinking through this text, and I was thinking about how Abraham is this image of hospitality and, and, and our, how our relationship with God is, is basically this gracious act of hospitality. Um, and I wrestled with, you know, why is it Abraham that acts in this way? You know, why, why does Abraham offer us this vision? Why not the three visitors, right? Now, granted, God is incredibly gracious to Abraham and Sarah. They promise a son, the last thing on earth that Sarah was ever expecting. And God actually delivered that son. I mean, it is a picture of grace to share this good news and to ask that question, is anything, is anything too wonderful for God? But even in the midst of that, why didn't God open up arms of hospitality to Abraham? Why didn't God, why didn't those three visitors welcome Abraham in? And as I, I was thinking about it this week and as, as I was wrestling, I, I realized that while the foundation of our relationship with God, our communion with God, our intimacy with God is grace and how God reaches out first to us, hospitality also goes to the heart of our own response to the gospel. We are called to hospitality. Not to earn anything, but merely as a reflection of what God has done in us. We are called to hospitality such that we love not only those who love us, but those who hate us, those who curse us. Now, I know that's really hard to do. I mean, I get that. And yet, that's exactly what God calls us to do. We're called to hospitality to host not only our friends, but also those who live on the margins, the ones our world works so hard to keep at arm's length, to convince us that they're a little bit strange and that maybe they should remain strangers. We're called to be a people committed to ministries of reconciliation, reconciling one to the other, which has always been critical, but perhaps has never been more critical than in this moment. As we move and live in a modern world, one that is riven by so much strife and so much anger. Most importantly, as important as, as it is to be hospitable one to the other, most importantly, there is a type of hospitality that, yes, we can demonstrate even to God. And to try and describe it, I, I want to close with a bit of poetry. Prose is great, but there are moments where poetry is even better. There's a poem by Christina Rossetti. I'm sure many of us are familiar with the words. It's been set to music, and it's actually a beloved Christmas uh, carol. Yes, I know we're about as far removed from Christmas as is technically possible, um, but I also thought that there was something rather fitting about reading so close to Midsummer, an excerpt from the poem in the bleak midwinter. 
Angels and archangels may have gathered there. Cherubim and seraphim thronged the air. But his mother only in her maiden bliss worshipped the beloved with a kiss. What can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. Yet what I can, I give him. Give my heart. Oh, my friends, may we each give our hearts to the one who gave his life. And may we embrace the astonishing hospitality, the wondrous communion, the life-changing intimacy we all are longing for in the deepest places of those hearts. Amen.